Well, good morning. I'm glad you're able to join us for this condensed or modified portion of worship this morning with Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church. Under the circumstances, we are uh, just going to provide a sermon for you this morning for meditation and spiritual guidance. But I do want to share the reading that we have this morning. It comes from John 3, verses 14 through 21. It says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the chosen one must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in the Chosen One might have eternal life. Yes, God so loved the world as to give the only begotten One, that whoever believes may not die, but have eternal life. God sent the only begotten into the world, not to condemn the world, but that through the One begotten the world might be saved. Whoever believes in the One begotten avoids judgment, but whoever doesn't believe is judged already for not believing in the name of the only begotten of God. Of these grounds is sentence pronounced that through the light came into the world, people showed they preferred darkness and the light because their deeds were evil. Indeed, people who do wrong hate the light and avoid it for fear their actions will be exposed. But people who live by the truth out into the light so it may be plainly seen that, they, that what they do is done in God. Will you pray with me? Loving God, you are one who continues to show us the unconditional love in our lives, and you allow us to fulfill God's perfect will when we are unable. Whether we are together or apart, you are never leaving us behind. You continue to allow us that unfailing gift of your presence in our lives. As we continue learning what the true meaning of your presence is, and as we move forward in our Lenten journey, let that journey bring us closer to the cross. So I now ask that you touch my lips of clay and mold them into the words that need to be spoken this morning, and the words that come from my mouth and the meditations from each and every one of our hearts, may they be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. So we've been on this Lenten journey in this series that we've titled Un, and I have to say that after the events of the past week or so, I've almost had to add an additional un, which would be unbelievable. And I say unbelievable because all the craziness that is going on when you go to the market or you go down the street, while I'm just as concerned as the next person with the happenings that have been evolving around this pandemic and everything around it, and not only in our own backyard but the world, it's just unbelievable. Now I get the water, and I get the paper towel hoarding, but I still haven't gotten past the toilet paper hoarding, which is still makes my eyes roll when I go down the aisles of the market. But what was even more rolling is that you go down the flour and the sugar aisle, and that's totally wiped out as long as pasta and pasta sauce. But that's for another Sunday morning sermon, maybe titled Hoarders. Now over the past few weeks, we've been talking about the uns in our lives, starting with being unshaken while knowing that God is unashamed of us and actually has chosen each of us to find how we are without God in our lives, that our lives are unmatched. So we're about two-thirds away through this series and bringing up to the gift of unfailing. And I must say that scripture this morning would be something I describe as unique. And the reason why I would say the scripture this morning is unique is because John chapter 3 is such a chapter that is done over and over and is used from that source of scripture that is contained within us. We hear John 3, John 3.16 so much that I think we have it as a popular scripture in our lives and I think practically everyone seems to use it. But this morning is a little bit of no exception. It's right there smack dab in the beginning of scripture this morning that God so loved the world and to give the only begotten one that whoever believes may not die but have eternal life. I think that scripture somehow has drawn to these words that come from Jesus when it's talking about the dark and the light. And I also find it most interesting that we have this, have this precedence amongst us that right in the midst of this pandemic, we're all dealing with the dark in the world at the light. Jesus draws this concept of light and dark, which is drawn throughout Scripture. But Jesus is yet coming back to this once again. 
We hear Jesus say towards the tail end of Scripture this morning that through the light came into the world, that people showed they preferred darkness to the light because their deeds were evil. Indeed, people who do wrong hate the light and avoid it for the fear that their actions will be exposed. And the reference here referring to the light is that direct reference to Jesus, that Jesus is the light coming into the world. But we also hear that the people show that they preferred darkness to light. Because the darkness here is pretty much referring to the evil and the sinfulness in our lives. Jesus tells us here that I've come into the world and I've brought this light for you, but the people instead still headed for the darkness because of their wrongdoing and the things that were wrong, they were avoiding the light for the fear that they'd be called out. Pretty much it's a thief going to steal, that they aren't going to do it in broad daylight, but rather they would do it in the pitchness of the dark. How many of you, when you were little, were afraid of the dark or being left alone in the dark? I know when I was a kid, my folks, when they sent us to bed, it would be that game of getting from the bedroom door to turning the light switch off and getting into bed. You see, there was that, how fast could you get from the door to the bed because you were the fear of those monsters were going to come out from beneath the bed and grab you. But I got smart as a kid because the light was on the nightstand next to the bed and it was plugged into the outlet, which was connected to the light switch. So I jump into bed, and then leave the switch on, and then just turn the light out by reaching over to the nightstand. Though this entire concept of light and darkness is found throughout Scripture, we get that fear of dark. It's that simpleness, that darkness that goes all the way to the back to the beginning of Scripture, Pretty much the very first thing we hear from God is, let there be light. And when that happened, we see that God separated the day and the night and the light from the darkness. And all the way through scripture, God is referred to as the light. And if you read through scripture, we'll know that you know, our friend Satan is referred to that prince of darkness. Believe it or not, Jesus used this language more often than not. We hear him telling Saul in Acts, around chapter 26, that he speaks of the light and the dark. And he says to Saul that I will deliver you from your own people and from the Gentiles to whom I send you. You will open their eyes so that they will turn from darkness to light, from the control of Satan to God. What's so interesting here is that darkness is being connected to evil and sin, and when it's what's more interesting to all of this is that the answer to all this darkness is so clearly found in this one person that we call Jesus. The answer to darkness isn't just found in the message from Jesus proclaiming the light, but it goes beyond what Jesus says and that he is the light. You know, the answer to all this darkness is clearly found within Jesus and who Jesus is. So if you check out John's Gospel a little bit further, about chapter 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me won't walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. You see, a little bit of light changes everything. Just be, By just having that little glimmer of light, it changes our lives. In other words, Jesus changes everything. Jesus makes the profound state of, I am the light of the world, and right after it, he has this encounter with the woman who was tried for adultery. It was only after that encounter that Jesus looked to all the people and says, listen, I'm the light of the world, and saying that knowing Jesus can cast that light on anything in the world in any form of desperate darkness and sinfulness, that Jesus can cast that light. I want to share some verses further into John's Gospel that maybe taking the story a little bit further, but going into the story of Jesus and the woman, that act of adultery. That particular story pretty much has three parts or three parts to this encounter. And I want to unwrap it a little bit. The first part of the story is that we see the law. There is the rights of the law, and in this chapter we hear it saying that at daybreak Jesus appears in the temple area. And when the people started coming to him, Jesus sat down and began to teach them. 
A couple had been caught in the act of adultery, and the scribes and the Pharisees brought only the woman, and they made her stand there in front of everyone. They said to Jesus, Teacher, the woman has been caught in adultery. So stopping there for a moment, because I'm going to tell you that I don't know everything about this story, but what I don't know is that, was the woman standing in front of everyone naked? Or had she grabbed a sheet on the way out that she had wrapped around her? But what I do know, yes, she was guilty. And I say that only because it doesn't give us any cushion as we read scripture to make speculation otherwise. But she was the one who was in the wrong, and I can probably be assured that she was standing there absolutely humiliated. She's now standing there in public shame. Now, as we say, picture this as our gal Sophia always says, but there's a group of guys who have caught this woman in this act of adultery. They drag her out of the situation, take her out into public, while trying to find Jesus, who claims to be that king, along with all the Pharisees who are the righteous hypocrites. They're all there to judge this woman. On a side note, the scripture has always had me question how these guys even knew that this guy whoever this guy is, that they were engaging in adultery to begin with. Was this guy that she was causing the sin with possibly setting her up? But here she stands in the middle of everybody, who knows what she's wearing, but right in the midst of them. Now while all the Pharisees are all standing there, we continue to hear that them say that in the law of Moses, the punishment for this act is strong. So what do you say about this? And as they were presenting this question to Jesus, you know, just in case Jesus didn't remember that there was this law, they were going to refresh his memory. I mean, you have to understand here that the woman is standing there, who knows, wearing what, scared to death, and these Pharisees are saying, hey Jesus, here's what the law says, she needs to be stoned. So what's the deal here, Jesus? What are you going to say? So what do you think, Jesus? I mean, they're talking about rocks here and stoning someone, killing someone, and the woman isn't only the only one on, on trial at the moment. Jesus, as well, is also on trial. Only because they're asking this question because they were trying to set Jesus up. Yeah? They want him to say, turn the lady free, that she's going to come back and say that she's free. And if he did that, well, I guess that, you know, you don't have any problems with adultery. And I'm sure they're thinking, ooh, well, we kind of got you now, Jesus. That's against the law, but you're making that statement to set her free. But what if Jesus came back and said to them, yeah, go ahead and stone her. If that's what the law says, then you're going to come back with, oh, well, come on now, Jesus. You're going to lose your reputation of being the loving and the one that comes on to each. But Jesus doesn't use any words. He simply allows the law to convict her and to reveal her guilt. I mean, everyone knows she's guilty. Jesus and the Pharisees, even the woman now knows that she's guilty, and the law has already convicted her that she has seen the sin. So this is what the law does. It reveals our sins, and Jesus allows the law to reveal her sin in the same way that it reveals any of our sins or our guilt. So the second part of this story is the part of love. The love that reveals God's grace. At this point we hear that Jesus bends down and starts writing with his finger in the ground, and the Pharisees are still standing around at this point. Even the woman is standing there humiliated. I mean, Jesus hasn't even delivered a verdict. Yet, he's bent over, writing in the ground. And they hear the Pharisees are ready to stone her, and I'm sure the crowd was ready for a big show. And, I mean, come on, Jesus, what do you want us to do? But Jesus is down there on his knees and begins writing something in the dirt. Jesus is pretty much writing down a record of the wrong. Here the Pharisees and the others continue to somewhat badger Jesus and ask him what his decision was. And as they were doing this, Jesus just gets up and tells them, Let the person among you who was without sin throw that first stone at the woman and then bent down again and started writing some more in the sand. 
And here this phrase without sin isn't a simple form of what that term when we hear it. It says what it really means is that not only is it you without sin, but also those of you who may never have wanted sin. In reality here, folks, Jesus is looking back at the Pharisees and pretty much implying here, okay, I'll now give you an answer. But first Jesus tells them that any of you who have not sinned or any of you who have never even wanted to sin before, well then you pick up that stone and be the first one to throw it. Go ahead. Do it. And you see, when they all heard this, they couldn't face the reality, and one by one, they all went away, starting with the older ones first. I have to say, I've always wondered why the older ones went away first, but I don't really have an answer to that, but maybe because they were deemed to be the wisest, but who knows. At this point, here is Jesus left alone with the, with the woman who is still there. Jesus is back down there on the ground, writing again, and yet stands up and addresses the woman by asking her where all the others went. No one has condemned her here. And here this broken and shamed woman, living in the darkest moment of her life, looks around and says to Jesus that there was no one. At this point, Jesus speaks to the woman and gives her grace-filled words that one could receive, saying that to the woman that she was not being condemned. But Jesus told her to go and to sin no more. The last part of the story is the light. And you see that it all comes back to Jesus because the light reveals our hope in the darkness. And after this encounter with the woman who felt so guilty and because the Pharisees and the scribes must have made their way back to Jesus that the next encounter is Jesus is then speaking to the Pharisees and the scribes and accuses them and tells them that I am the light of the world and whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but will always have that true light of life. See, Jesus is telling us no matter what darkness that comes into this world, whatever we bring this darkness, whether it's adultery or greed or anything that's going around the pandemic or anything that is dark in our world, Jesus says that his light can and will penetrate that darkness. That Jesus' grace is great enough to penetrate and make things good. You know, with all that's been happening in our world, Jesus continues to assure us that his presence is always in our hearts and will heal and never unfailing us and never turning things backwards but forward. Even though we cannot physically be present with one another today, know that there is no separation of our faith to God. And even to one another, and whether we are here in person or at home this morning watching and listening, that we are fortunately doing it through the power of technology, and that God is through us and Jesus is through God, and they both are always in our hearts. So as we continue to be healed and as we continue to go through our journey to the cross, I want to give you blessings each and every day moving forward and as we come together, hopefully soon, that our love will be reunited. So God's blessings to you. Amen.